Okay, then, you know, I can just speak from here. Good morning. My name is Manoj, Manoj Panda, director of this institute. And I welcome you all to this workshop on priority setting in the health sector, practices and possibilities in India. I am delighted that The researchers from York University came down all the way to present their work here. Professor Claxton, Mrs. Ochalek, and James Lomas. It's also a gathering of several well known health sector specialists in India. Both from the academic world, as well as from the policy making world. And we hope that today's interactions will be a very fruitful one. The, I'm, I thank the session chairs, the discussants, and also the distinguished participants. You know, priority setting in the health, as in other sectors, of course, arises due to limited resources. <coughs> the demand for resources are always much higher than what is available. We need to set priorities because of that. And this priority setting doesn't take place only at the government level. It, of course, takes place at the individual decision-making level, at the household level. A household has to decide what kind of insurance policies you may have, how much to save for health expenditures, out-of-pocket expenses. It's a question of affordability, but also at the time of certain critical diseases, they are compelled to spend preempting resources from other uses. In fact, several studies for India, they saw that the health expenditure is the single most region for households to come slight down below the poverty line. Those who are slightly above the poverty line, they have gone off due to different programs and other policies. At times, they come down just because of the health expenditure. And that becomes a critical thing. But it is not only just the low income group. Even the middle income group, or at times even the high income group, they find it difficult to meet the expenses. And hence, the priority setting becomes critical. You know, from various quarters, in various seminars, one common theme that runs around is that the allocation of resources by the government is very low, particularly in a country like India. Of course, the developed countries possibly they spend 5, 6 or 7 percent of their GDP. Here it is much less. A question also comes up, 
how to get the cooperation of the private sector which areas the private sector might focus on which areas the government might focus on in the context of the recent big program that the government announced for example the health insurance policies for about 100 million households that's an announcement they have done till now you know they have to work out the details but in that context questions also come up what will be the role of the tertiary sector which possibly it's only government which can spread it wide throughout the country and reach out to all sections what is the best way to go about is insurance the best instrument to go about for health service delivery or there are other instruments available we have to learn from various countries and in the coming years as india moves on some of the choices will be critical and i am happy that professor indrani gupta has taken so much interest in issues on health economics and you know she has also been very active on issues related to universal health care recently both professor gupta and samik they have completed one study on universal health care and some of these issues have to be debated in different forums we have to interact with the government and more than that we have to interact with external researchers like those from the york university and again i am again welcome you all and uh, uh, let's hope for a very productive day thank you um thank you professor panda uh, you have said most of what i uh, wanted to say i want to just extend a very warm and personal welcome to all of you especially to the team from york uh, we are very happy that uh, dr carl claxton dr jesse gohlek and dr james lomas have been able to come and join us uh, all the way from york university um, also dr sumit majumdar who is a new entrant into that or york team and a special thanks and welcome to dr migda dasarya who made this happen actually he's uh, he's also a team member from the center of health economics at york university this center by the way is one of the largest centers that does health economics work and they work very closely with the uk government and have been influencing their health policy for a while so we have a lot to learn from all of you i want to actually thank our indian participants who have made uh, uh, themselves available all of them are experts in the steeped in the health sector policies and health sector research so uh, this interaction between the team from york and all of you is going to be critical in understanding this whole setup setting of uh, priority setting uh, exercise i just want to say a few things about why we are doing this of course we want to hear from uh, the uk's experience but we are also doing it because recently we have seen in india we have been announcing policies on universal health coverage and we have often wondered whether these have been backed by solid evidence or or research and uh, how else could we have done it maybe there are other ways that we can learn from other countries where priority setting is such a key exercise we are spending 1.4% of our gdp on the health sector so resources are scarce this is what we teach in econ 101 that when resources are scarce you have to understand the cost benefits of what you spend and opportunity cost of resources so when we don't go down one route uh, what are we sacrificing and what are the costs of not taking another route india in the recent past in the last one year uh, the ministry of health and family welfare has set up the uh, medical technology assessment board 
which is like the Health Technology Assessment uh, Council of India. It's a really good and noble step and a good initiative. So we are very happy that this is so uh, relevant to that exercise. At the same time, I want us to all think so that this day's proceedings can uh, can be a little focused. Is what is that? What is it that the MTAP can actually do for India? Is it really uh, uh, just applying? Uh, methodologies that have been applied elsewhere for health technology assessment uh, a bit blindly to the Indian context because the contexts are completely different. UK has a system which is homogeneous, they have a you know, NHS. We don't really have a system like that. So to evaluate a diverse set of technologies uh, uh, that apply to a diverse set of stakeholders in a, in a situation like ours where private sector is the dominant player, we really need to sit back and think how relevant are uh, such evaluations for India. First of all, we don't really do evaluation. We know that there is no uh, cost benefit or cost effectiveness analysis done anyways to launch any health policy whatsoever. Now that MTAB has been set up, we are hoping that that might change a bit. And maybe if the NHPS, God forbid, I don't want it to come, but if the NHPS does hit the uh, country, Maybe some of these uh, uh, methodologies can then be applied to evaluate different technologies that can be folded into the uh, NHPS, the National Health Protection Scheme. But whether or not we should have done NHPS is also a question that we must ask ourselves. And we want to know from all of you whether we can step back a little and see programmatic evaluations rather than health technology specific evaluation. So um, I don't want to go on uh, much longer. We have a very interesting uh, two uh, sets of presentations today actually. One that tells us about the UK system and how we decide on cost effectiveness and how we decide on thresholds. How do we know something is cost effective? Because that, that has to do a lot with what are the cutoffs for evaluating uh, particular uh, effectiveness cutoffs that we have to evaluate. And the second part is very interesting where uh, we are assessing um, in a federal structure, it's very, very pertinent. Like in India, we are trying to look at state spending and trying to see how states can effectively uh, allocate their resources across uh, uh, you know, different possibilities. So both the presentations are very important. And what do we want out of this workshop since you have all taken the time to come here? So we, I, I do think that at the end of the day, where we do have a, a panel discussion on, on what all of you think, and we also have discussions for every session, but maybe at the end of the day, we can come up with some crisp recommendations because there are now processes that have been set up in India. So we do have channels of reaching the policymakers that probably didn't exist a year and a half before. So if we find that something can be actually conveyed, and there are other ways of conveying things to the policymakers, and we want to learn how UK has actually made this so possible to interact, the, the interaction between researchers and policymakers have been such a close one. We also want to do a similar thing in India. So let's um, uh, sit back and enjoy the proceedings. And uh, uh, the director also wants me to say a few words about IEG. Uh, for those of you who don't really know, we are we had been set up in the early 50s. And um, we are uh, 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 an institute of economists. We are really a think tank that uh, was set up as uh, advisors to the government in a way, early uh, after, right after independence. The health unit is a really uh, uh, late uh, entrant into these uh, various themes that we work on, but we work on agriculture, industry, macro modeling, uh, uh, environment, and a whole lot of other issues. So we are mostly economists. We also have a very active sociology unit in, in IEG. They do a lot of uh, work on, on a very, very, uh, uh, you know, on very themes. So um, that's who we are. Uh, let's enjoy the day. Let's just think about how we can influence policymaking uh, in terms of in, in, the, in the realm of priority setting. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, just a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, we are not breaking for tea. Tea is available for anybody who's feeling thirsty and just right outside here, don't have to go down. Uh, we will break for lunch at 12.30. Uh, and uh, is there anything else that we need to talk about? And there is, uh, if you all feel a little restless, there are flowers blooming everywhere in IG. So too, please feel free to walk around and, and take a look at all the colors and hues we have here. So thank you very much for joining us. I'll just hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Sheila Prasad. 
the bios of all the speakers and discussions are in your folder. So I didn't think we needed to spend time on introducing each of our speakers. You can find out all about them from, uh, from your folder. So may I invite uh, Dr. Sheila Prasad to come and share the next session? Yeah, she will come here. That's OK. And our uh, speaker here. Uh, I'm Sheila Prasad. I have recently superannuated from Government of India, from the Ministry of uh, Rural Development as Chief Economic Advisor. Prior to that, for five years to six years, I was with the Department of Health uh, in Government of India and was uh, closely associated with uh, formulation of the health policy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Ohalik. I'm a research fellow at the Center for Health Economics at the University of York. Um, and I've been there for about three and a half years and primarily work on methods for priority setting. Uh, Carl Claxton, University of York, uh, professor in the economics department uh, and in the Center for Health Economics. Uh, work with NICE since it was formed, but also now work quite closely with the UK Department of Health. Uh, uh, Sumit Majumdar, I am soon joining uh, University of York as a research fellow in the Center for Health Economics. Mithgada Saria, I'm also a research fellow at the University of York, but I'm here for a year in Delhi and I'm affiliated here at the Institute of Economic Growth as well. Good morning, my name is Borali Zaran. I'm from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, IIT Madras. I work in the area of healthcare. Yeah, my name is Abhiruk Mukhopadhyay. I am at the economics department at the Indian Statistical Institute in Delhi. I work in human capital, so health is an important part of that. So I work in that. Um, I'm Anindya Chaudhary. I work for the Global Development Network. Uh, I don't work necessarily in health economics, but I'm very interested in it, and I try to keep in touch. So thank you, Nandini. I am Dr. Suresh Sharma, uh, Associate Professor and Acting Head in Population Research Center, Institute of Economics Growth. Good morning. I'm Veena Naregal from the Sociology Unit here at IEG. Uh, I'm interested in the politics of knowledge, and I've been working on historicizing social policy. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, this is. So me through. So I'm a faculty at uh, School of Health System Studies, Tata Institute of Social Sciences. I work on health systems issues. I am Pritam. I'm associated with the uh, National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. Varun Kanjilal, professor in health economics, recently retired from IIHMR. Yeah. I'm Neeta Chaudhary. I'm a uh faculty at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. Uh, we've been working primarily on the public financing of healthcare in India. Uh, Devashis Parikh, I am working as an associate fellow at National Council of Applied Economic Research. Priyanka Saxena, I work in the WHO India country office on health policy issues. Well, good morning to all of you. I am Anirudh Prasad Singh from Jamia Millia Islamia University. My specialization is in trade issues in health policies. Thank you. Good morning. I am William Joe. I am assistant professor here at IEG. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I am Suresh Mohammed from the World Bank Senior Health Specialist. Good morning. I am Ritu Priya. I teach at the Center of Social Medicine and Community Health at Jawaharlal Nehru University. I work on health policy from an interdisciplinary perspective. 
with the medical background and epidemiology, political economy, popular culture, linking all of those together. Indrani Gupta at the Institute of Economic Growth. Manoj Panda from IEG. I work in the area of macroeconomics, issues in poverty and environment. Uh, James Lomas, a research fellow at the Center for Health Economics at the University of York. Once again, a very warm welcome to the session. Uh, we, uh, I will not, uh, as um, Professor Indrani Gupta said, uh, not waste time introducing since the bios are in the folder. So I, our sp uh, speaker for this session is Professor Carl Claxton, who would be addressing us on issues relating to prioritizing decisions for the health sector and uh, the lessons that we can learn from the UK model and how it can be applied here. Our two discussions here, we have Professor Murlitharan and Professor Kanjilal, who, who would be taking the discussion forward. Uh, without much uh, ado, I would now request Professor uh, Carl Claxton to take over the session. Thank you. First of all, a really big thanks to uh, IEG, uh, 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 um, particularly to uh, 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 particularly to uh, uh, Indrani for hosting this session, um, and a really big thanks to everybody who's attending and taking time out, and especially to the discussants who've taken time to take a look at some of this work and prepare. Uh, 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 and prepare their discussions. So, a really big thanks. We've this is our first time in India. We've uh, spent a little time in Chandigarh at the conference and the workshop. And we're one of the purposes of this visit is for us to start to gain a little bit of an understanding about the nature of the Indian healthcare system and the challenges that have been faced and the key decisions that 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 that, uh, that need to be informed. So. A really big thanks. Uh, we've enjoyed our time considerably, and we're starting to get a feel for some of the considerable challenges that uh, that differ markedly from uh, from from uh, from those that we face in the UK. What what I wanted to do was to try and set out the experience that we've had in the UK over the last fifteen to twenty years in terms of how economic evaluation of health investments has started to inform policy and some of the critical questions that have had to be addressed. And then the work that we've been doing more recently, uh, supported by our UK Department of Health in trying to understand health opportunity costs in the UK healthcare system. Try and draw out a few lessons from that, and then maybe talk more briefly about how that might be relevant to the kind of decisions that have been faced uh, in, uh, in the Indian healthcare system. So, Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Absolutely. So I'll tell you a little bit about my background. So uh, I was a founding member of the NICE Appraisal Committee when it was first formed in 1999. So I sat on that committee making decisions about whether or not to approve new health technologies for the UK NHS. I sat on that committee for over 10 years and then I moved to another committee that made decisions about devices. So I was involved in NICE appraisal as a decision maker for about 13 years. At the same time, I was also working as an academic and a researcher, providing some of the inputs into that, into that process and contributed to the development of the, the guide for the methods of how these technologies and interventions ought to be appraised. So that was a, a really useful uh, experience. Uh, was involved in many of the more controversial decisions that NICE made during that time. I uh, was involved in uh, some of the challenges that were made to that process. There were a number of appeals. Uh, I represented the Committee at Appeal. And then critically, uh, there was a judicial review of the process. Uh, that judicial review was brought by two manufacturers. And at that point, uh, the court could have decided that the way that NICE 
considered evidence and thought about costs and effects and cost per quality was, uh, was something that was not legitimate. Thankfully, we won that uh, judicial review. And as a result, if you like, the process of basing decisions for a collectively funded healthcare system on evidence and an assessment of costs is something that's now well established in case law. So that has been a really uh, important uh, experience. As we'll see once the slides are loaded, um, a key question uh, has been what constitutes something that's worthwhile? We might go to an awful lot of effort in estimating cost, the, the, the cost of an intervention, the health benefit that we might get from that intervention and express that in terms of the cost per quality gained. But a key question is, well, is that worthwhile or not? What is the threshold beyond which we say no? And what is the threshold at which we say, yes, let's approve this for widespread use? And that key question has been something that has not been subject to empirical investigation until relatively recent times. We uh, won the grant from the Medical Research Council to try and estimate health opportunity costs in the UK some years ago. That research reported in 2015. The UK Department of Health then took that up and are now funding us, have funded us since then, to continue to assess health opportunity costs for the UK healthcare system. Essentially, what we're finding is that our healthcare system is very productive of health, that relatively modest amounts of money have a big impact on health. In other words, the cost effectiveness threshold is much lower than people previously thought. Now, that's telling us a couple of things. First of all, it's telling us that expenditure on healthcare in the NHS is very valuable uh, and much more valuable than people we gain net production benefits in the wider economy. The second thing that those um, estimates tell us is that we are currently paying too much for innovation in terms of branded pharmaceuticals. Uh, most of those new drugs, particularly cancer drugs, uh, when we look at the evidence, suggest that it's about 50,000 pounds per quality offered by those new cancer drugs, sometimes considerably higher our estimates suggest that the most the NHS can afford to pay for those benefits is £15,000 per quality. In other words, at the moment, at current global prices, actually branded pharmaceuticals are doing considerable harm to our healthcare system. And that's starting to inform current negotiations which are going on at the moment about how to reform our pharmaceutical price regulation scheme. And I've got a couple of slides about the potential scheme that is being considered as part of those negotiations of how to make sure that we get prices, effective prices, in the UK that reflects how much our healthcare system can afford to pay for the benefits. Um, it's a rebate scheme, which uh, anyway, I'll come on. Now I've got the slides up. I'll talk about that a little later. So I guess just to reiterate, I joined Nice when it was first formed in 1999 and was involved in 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 those early appraisals and was part of NICE throughout this period. Uh, this just indicates how NICE grew. NICE started off as quite a small organization, but over time has been given more and more responsibilities, not just for technologies, not just for drugs, but for many different kinds of programs, including public health programs, diagnostics, devices, a whole range of things. Uh, also including the way in which we incentivize our primary care doctors to do certain things that are really important. So. The role of NICE has expanded dramatically. It's also involved in writing broad clinical guidelines in many different clinical areas. What does, but what runs throughout 
all of these different functions are the same core principles of what do we need to know about a proposal to spend more NHS money on a new program of care and investment in a new technology? We need to know what are the additional health benefits and the additional costs, including any potential for cost savings of adopting a new and effective program. So we need a measure of health benefit. We need a measure that captures the impact that we might have both on length of life uh, and quality of life. We need a measure that's comparable across the very many different decisions that we're making. We need it to be comparable for a number of reasons. Firstly, many interventions have impacts across many different diseases with very different outcomes. Secondly, if we're making social choices on behalf of uh, the citizens that can benefit from our healthcare system, those choices and decisions need to be fair. So the decision that we make in one clinical area needs to be made on the same basis as we make elsewhere. And thirdly, it needs to be comparable because when we adopt a new technology with additional costs, the health opportunity cost, the health that we're going to have to give up, the things we're going to have to give up elsewhere in the healthcare system are in very uh, different disease areas. So for all those reasons, we need a comparable measure. The one adopted by NICE is a quality adjusted life year. So we also, uh, so if we need an estimate of the likely effects on health and cost, we're going to have to combine evidence from multiple sources, particularly when we need to make many different comparisons, some of which have not been uh, uh, represented in the clinical trials. So a core kind of method has been the use of decision analytic modeling to try and combine all that evidence to estimate costs and effects of the alternatives we can consider. And by and large, the summary measure that's been used has been looking at the incremental cost effectiveness ratio expressed as a cost per quali, or alternatively, we can express as a cost per DALI averted. But that's not enough. Uh, uh, conducting that analysis to estimate costs and effects is important, but it's not enough. Because we need to answer this question, is the cost per quali gained by the proposed investment in healthcare worthwhile? And for that, we need to ask a question, does that, is that going to come with additional resources? Are additional resources going to be made available? If they are, then the question is, well, what else could we have done with those resources? What are the health effects of the other things that we could have done with that additional resource? More commonly in the UK, if we approve a new investment in healthcare, that's gonna, those additional costs will need to be accommodated from existing commitments. So the question becomes, what are the health effects of the other things that are going to have to be given up to accommodate this new investment? So HTA and cost-effectiveness analysis has been central to all the functions of NICE. And just to kind of illustrate the same point graphically, imagine the origin represents what's currently available in our NHS. Let's imagine we have been out, we've identified relevant evidence, we have combined it and synthesized it, and we estimate that for every patient treated with this new intervention, we expect to gain two quality adjusted life years. At the price that's been charged by, let's say, the manufacturer, the additional costs are £20,000 per patient treated. We can summarize that as this new intervention offers us a quality at a rate of £10,000 per quality gain. Is it worthwhile? Well, that depends where the £20,000 is going to come from and what else we could have done with it. In other words, we need a cost effectiveness threshold that represents health opportunity costs elsewhere in our healthcare system. If we believe that's £20,000 per quality, what we're really saying is that every £20,000 of NHS expenditure could have been used to generate gain one quality elsewhere. So if that's true, then in this case, this new technology, this investment is worthwhile. We expect to gain two qualities per patient treated. The costs mean that we expect to displace or lose one quality elsewhere in our healthcare system. So overall, we improve the net health benefit for our healthcare system by one quality for every patient treated. This is indeed worthwhile. Why? Because it improves overall net health benefit. We improve health outcomes overall. If the price and the cost of this technology was a little higher, let's say the price is now P star, the additional costs are 40,000 pounds. It's the same technology, so we still gain two qualities. It's just as effective, but now it's 20,000 pounds per quality. It just matches our health opportunity cost. What does that mean? We might regard it as being cost effective, 
but actually the health benefits are just matched by what we have to give up elsewhere. It's cost effective, but the net health impact on our healthcare system is zero. This, in other words, PSTAR is the maximum we can afford uh, to pay for the benefits that this new intervention offers. Of course, the price is higher and the costs are higher, £60,000, now it's £30,000 per quality. If we approve this technology at that price, what is the impact? Well, if we approve it, it means that the health opportunity costs, what we have to give up elsewhere in our healthcare system, exceeds the benefits that this intervention offers. If we approve uh, 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 this technology at that price, actually reduce health outcomes overall. We do net harm to our healthcare system. So these are the principles that have underpinned all of NICE appraisal, whether it's technologies, public health interventions, uh, diagnostics, medical devices. And, uh, and, uh, and in a way, this HTA and cost effectiveness analysis is at the heart of what NICE has done because the primary objective of our national healthcare system is to improve overall health. And if you want to improve overall health, you need to take account of the health opportunity costs. Of course, NICE has put an awful lot of effort into specifying good methods to assess the benefits and the costs of new technologies. We have a, a reference case, which is very detailed kind of manual about how what methods ought to be used. I guess key things is comparators. We need to compare all relevant alternatives. We have a perspective that in the UK, at least, is restricted to the healthcare system itself. We have a time horizon which says we need to capture all effects uh, on costs and benefits over, uh, sometimes over the lifetime of patients. We need to synthesize all evidence, and then we need to have a measure of health that reflects length and quality of life. So we put an awful lot of effort into specifying how to measure costs and benefits, and we've adopted decision analytic modeling. Uh, we specify probabilistic analysis, so we assign distributions to input parameters into these models to reflect the uncertainty that we might have. We, we use uh, Monte Carlo simulation to estimate expected costs and effects and the distribution. So we put an awful lot of effort into uh, the sophistication of how we measure costs and effects. The results look like this. Uh, these are the, the blue and the green uh, uh, symbols represent uh, where NICE has approved new technologies. I guess what you can see is that NICE never says no uh, below £30,000 per quality. So although NICE has got a threshold range of 20 to 30, 30 is really the lower bound of the range. It never says no below 30 and often says yes uh, above £30,000 per quality. So NICE has put a lot of effort into methods of estimation, but I guess the key thing that hasn't been subject to such rigorous empirical evaluation is this key question about what that threshold ought to be. Now, NICE specified a threshold of 20 to 30,000 pounds in 2004. It was based on looking back at the decisions that my committee had made over the previous four years and identifying the range that describes when we said yes and when we said no. In other words, it doesn't really have any empirical foundation. It's just an implied value from previous decisions. It's not related to any empirical estimate of what's likely to happen in the NHS. As you've just seen, in reality, it's not 20 to 30. NICE doesn't say no below 30. There's recent work that's looked at NICE decisions that suggest that actually it's around about 40 when NICE is indifferent between a yes and a no. And in some circumstances, we know NICE goes up to 50 and thousand pounds per quality and sometimes beyond. But none of this has any empirical foundation. If we want to think about what the evidence might show us about health opportunity costs, what we really need is to estimate the relationship between changes in health expenditure and health outcomes. In other words, what we need is an estimate of the marginal productivity of our healthcare system. If you like, an estimate of the shadow price of the constraint on healthcare expenditure. That's what we need to estimate. We have the opportunity to do that in the UK because we have expenditure by disease area called program budget categories, collections of ICD codes. 
we have expenditure by disease area by local area of the NHS, 152 local areas of the NHS. We also have outcomes, mortality outcomes in those disease areas, again, by local area. So we have an opportunity to exploit that cross-sectional variation and try to estimate the relationship between a change in expenditure and a change in outcome. And that's what we did, funded by the Medical Research Council some years ago. And it's that work that's provided the foundation for the work that we continue to do for the UK Department of Health. Let me try and just graphically illustrate uh, what we uh, have tried to estimate. We're able to estimate two things. For each program budget category, there's 23 of them, we're able to estimate spend elasticities. In other words, how a change in overall expenditure tends to get allocated to these different disease areas. For those program budget categories, those disease areas where we have mortality, then we're also able to estimate outcome equations, outcome elasticities. How a change in expenditure in a particular disease area tends to affect mortality in that disease area. In both cases, there's a challenge, which is, of course, we have to make sure that we've accounted for all the reasons why these different geographical areas might differ in order to isolate the causal effect of differences in expenditure. And, of course, we have endogeneity, the potential for endogeneity, so we're having to use instrumental variables to control for those unobserved uh, heterogeneity. So, but with these two things, we can estimate the effect of a change in expenditure on mortality outcomes. But of course, we need to translate that into a more complete measure of health, one that includes survival and quality of life. We don't have any observations on quality of life to directly estimate it. But what we can do is to use the mortality signal that we can estimate as a surrogate for a more complete uh, uh, measure of impact on health. So we can apply that estimated impact on the mortality burden of disease and apply that to a measure of burden of disease based on qualities. So we have quality burden of disease for all 1,500 ICD codes. We're able to apply that. We also need to think about these other program budget categories, disease areas where effectively there isn't any mortality. What are we going to do about those? And what we've done is to say, well, what would happen if we had the same proportionate effect on disease burden in these other areas and apply that to measures of quality burden in those areas? In other words, we need to make some assumptions of surrogacy and extrapolation. And in that way, we can get an estimate of the cost per quality gained for a change in expenditure. Now, these are assumptions. Uh, more recently, we've conducted a formal elicitation exercise to elicit from clinical experts and also policymakers the details about whether these assumptions are reasonable in different disease areas. The, the results of that have just been submitted to journal. What we're finding is that, if anything, these assumptions are likely to underestimate the overall effect of healthcare expenditure. But these are the most recent results looking back of 10 waves of data, applying this cross-section analysis to each wave of expenditure data. Uh, and what you can see is that the cost per quality is less than £15,000 per quality. So NICE is making decisions at 30, 30, 40, 50. In actual fact, the evidence suggests it's something like £15,000 per quality or maybe even less. Now, what does that mean? I think what this is telling us is that, as I said, healthcare expenditure in the UK is very productive of health. The marginal productivity of healthcare expenditure is much better than people initially thought. In other words, this has been used by the Department of Health to protect healthcare expenditure budgets in negotiations with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Treasury. What else does it tell us? Well, it tells us we're spending, we're paying too much for pharmaceutical innovation. Uh, the global price has been charged uh, are too high for our healthcare system. And it's also telling us that the way in which NICE is currently making decisions is potentially doing considerable harm to our local NHS. Let's just take a look at that. So for every 10 million pounds of additional healthcare expenditure that a NICE decision imposes on the NHS, uh, if, for example, it, it approves a drug at 40,000 pounds per quality, which is what it does on average, and spends 10 million, then we would expect to gain 250 quality adjusted life years. What this evidence is suggesting is that that 10 million pounds 
will lead to a loss of 773 qualies elsewhere in the NHS. In other words, we are doing net harm by approving drugs at, at these kind of cost effectiveness ratios. And in fact, the ratio of harm to benefit is something like three to one. And not only do we have the empirical evidence that we're doing harm, actually anecdotally, we know at a local level, uh, our local level, our healthcare system is finding it very difficult to accommodate these recommendations to approve these new and expensive drugs. But because we've been able to estimate this at disease area level, not only can we say something about the scale of health opportunity costs for the UK, we can also say something about the type of health opportunity costs and where those health opportunity costs are likely to fall. So these are the estimated effects of 10 million pounds worth of NHS costs. A new drug that costs the NHS 10 million pounds, what's likely to happen? Well, the dark green shows where we've got direct econometric estimates of those effects, where we expect to see increases in mortality and uh, reductions in survival, in particular in circulatory disease, in respiratory, gastrointestinal and cancer. Those are the big impacts, those are the disease areas where we'll see big impacts on mortality and survival. In terms of quality of life effects, we expect to see quality of life effects in respiratory disease, in neurological disease and importantly in mental health. Those in the light green below the line is where we don't have any direct estimates and we've had to extrapolate effects. What you can see is that most of them don't really matter very much at all, but it's mental health that's the big important one. So we can start to make health opportunity costs a little more real, that the people who bear the true cost of approving a new branded pharmaceutical, the people who bear the true costs are often hidden and don't have a voice in that discussion. And this work, in a way, starts to make those, the people who truly bear the cost, a little bit more real and are included more in those deliberations. So our UK estimates, as I said, we've got some idea of the scale of health opportunity costs. We know something about the type and where those are likely to occur by disease area and by age and gender. That means we know something about the severity of disease in which these health opportunity costs are likely to occur. We also know, as we'll see in a moment, we also know something about the net production effects, both on marketed and non-marketed production. Because we're estimating at ICD code by age and gender, we can link these effects to estimates of net production by age, gender, health effect, and ICD code. We also are able to ask the question, what is the impact of health expenditure on health inequality? Other work funded by the Department of Health that we've done in the Centre for Health Economics has been able to do that. We find that actually health expenditure improves uh, health equity. We've also been able to, uh, by splitting the sample, we've also been able to ask the question, what is the impact uh, of non-marginal impacts? In other words, the how does the scale of budget impact affect the scale of health opportunity costs? And we find what you would expect with diminishing marginal returns, that the greater the budget impact, proportionately greater the health opportunity costs. In other words, the cost effectiveness threshold to apply when we have a proposed investment with a very large non-marginal budget impact is lower than one that is a marginal budget impact. And as I say, we're re-estimating, the work is ongoing, we're re-estimating this not just for subsequent waves of data, we've been back, we've used different approaches to identification, single instrument strategy, we've uh, adopted a completely different approach to identification, we find the same results which gives us some confidence that actually the IV approach is, 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 is reasonable. And we've now got a panel data set which we're just starting, well James is just starting to uh, explore. But now, in the UK, we kind of currently restrict things to the NHS perspective, health benefits, NHS costs. Our healthcare system, there is very little out-of-pocket expenditure. But there was certainly a lot of pressure from pharmaceutical manufacturers that we ought to take account of the impact that their, the benefits of their product have on the wider economy and returning people to work. 
There was a lot of pressure to do that. The Department of Health asked us to consider that in 2010. It came back again uh, in value-based assessment that was considered by NICE in 2014. And we were able to contribute to that debate. Uh, try and illustrate it with an example. So this is just some numbers uh, from a NICE appraisal of Lacentis for macular edema. Now, approving this branded drug would cost the NHS 80 million pounds, additional 80 million pounds per year. We expect to get some quality benefits of about 3,000 qualities gained by using this new technology. It's in a disease area that's quite severe uh, in terms of severity, in terms of quality loss as a consequence of the disease. And we're able to estimate that those 3,000 qualities would generate about 88 million pounds of net production benefits for the wider economy. Now, of course, what manufacturers tell us is, well, this is great. It costs you 80 million pounds. It saves you 88 million pounds and you gain 3,000 qualities. You should just say yes, or you should pay us a higher price. Of course, that's very misleading indeed, because that 80 million pounds of NHS resource is not money in the wider economy. And this 88 million pound in the wider economy is not money that the NHS can use to generate health. In other words, we need to take account of the health opportunity costs. Actually, what we know is that that 80 million pounds would actually lead to 6,000 qualities being displaced elsewhere in the NHS. So the real choice here is 3,000 qualities gained versus 6,000 qualities lost. In other words, a net loss of 3,000 qualities versus a gain of 88 million pounds for the wider economy. Now, okay, is it worth it? It depends. Depends how much you think health is worth in consumption terms. If it's less than £30,000 per quality, then you'd say yes. But this isn't the end of the story, because what this misses out on is the fact that NHS expenditure that produces health also produces net benefit for the wider economy. Sorry. Ah. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. The animation doesn't work. So the final punchline is this is that actually once we take account of the fact that these 6,000 qualities would have been used and would have generated value in the rest of the economy, the value of those 6,000 qualities in the rest of the economy is 77 million. In other words, the net effect for the wider economy is a gain of six, 16 million for the wider economy, not 88, versus the loss of 3,000 qualities. In other words, taking account of health opportunity costs enables us to really cut through some of the uh, arguments made by the lobby that want to see us pay higher prices for branded technologies. Now, as a consequence of this, uh, manufacturers were less keen on taking full account of these wider effects because what it means is that if we do, it doesn't mean they're going to get higher prices. Sometimes their prices will be lower. I mean, this is illustrating a similar thing that we were able to do. So these are the net production effects for every quality gained in a sample of ICD codes where NICE has recently issued guidance. What you can see that for some of those ICD codes, the net production effects are actually negative. For some of them, they're positive. And the one in bold is that on average, on average, the net production effects of NHS expenditure. So as I say, the evidence suggests that we spend 13,000 pounds in the NHS, we gain one quality, and we also gain about £12,000 worth of wider uh, 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 social benefits. Ah, there we go. So that's the final, that's the final comparison. That actually once we take into account these, uh, the opportunity costs don't just fall on health, they fall on the wider economy as well. Actually, that £88 million pounds means 6, 000, uh, uh, a loss of 6,000 qualities and a loss of 72 million pounds in the wider economy. Is 16 million pounds worth it? A gain of net 6 million, 16 million pounds worth it compared to a loss of 3,000 qualities? Well, it depends, but you'd have to be willing to pay less than, uh, less than 5,000 pounds per quality, which is just not credible. So we should say no. So, 
what are some lessons uh, that I would pull out from the UK? I think the structure of the appraisal process of an HTA body is really important. Uh, what's really important is the independence of appraisal and the assessment process, the decision-making process from the appraisal of the evidence. That's embedded at NICE. It appears to be the way in which the HTA board here in India has been set up following those same principles. Of course, we require good methods to estimate costs and benefits. We need a comparable measure of health, comparison of alternatives, use all the relevant evidence, and we need to represent uncertainty. And that appears to be reflected in the reference case that's been developed for HTA here in India. I think there's two lessons, though, um, that I would take from the UK experience that haven't necessarily yet been fully learned in the UK. The first one is the importance of an independent assessment of health opportunity cost to make sure that that's evidence-based and cannot be dialed up and down according to the political pressures that have been placed on the decision-making institute. That's basically what's happened to NICE. It has been placed under considerable pressure to say yes to new technologies and it has allowed it to, if you like, dial up the threshold. Because that threshold doesn't have any empirical foundation, it becomes something that can be dialed up and down depending on the political pressures. And that has done, I believe, considerable damage to the NHS. So an independent assessment of health opportunity cost, I think, is critical. I think the, the other thing that needs to be fixed that isn't currently fixed is to link HTA to a price negotiation mechanism. We don't really have an effective price negotiation mechanism in the UK. NICE is not allowed to directly negotiate with manufacturers. Now, of course, the problem that we've got is that we represent, the UK represents 3% of the world market. We cannot expect manufacturers to reduce their prices for the UK market when the UK is linked to 25% of the rest of the global market. They'll worry about reference pricing, they'll worry about parallel trade. They simply would prefer not to sell their products in the UK than to reduce their list price. So what we need to do is to think about ways in which we can have mechanisms that allow effective price discrimination between the UK and the rest of the world. And one thing that's being considered at the moment as part of our renegotiation of the price regulation scheme is to think about value-based rebates. In other words, we need, we need to get rebate agreements with manufacturers where the rebates they pay the NHS reflect the discrepancy between the prices, the global prices they charge, and how much we can afford to pay for the benefits that their products offer by indication. So this is kind of a schematic of what's been proposed. NICE does the appraisal of costs and benefits, but it is no longer making decisions for the NHS. On the far right, we have an independent, empirically-based assessment of health opportunity costs. In the middle, we have the Department of Health. The Department of Health takes those two pieces of information and says to manufacturers, at your current global price, if we're going to approve this, we need you to sign a rebate agreement. And that rebate reflects the discrepancy. If you sign up to the rebate agreement and include your product in your national rebates that you pay every year, then we know we're getting our money back so we can reimburse prescribers. Prescribers can be told this product is part of the rebate agreement. If you prescribe it and pay for it at the high global price, you will be reimbursed by centre. So we will incentivize early uptake of new medicines. Of course, in all this, it's very important that we have volume agreements as part of those rebates so that we don't have uh, unnecessary uh, and excessive volumes. In other words, once volume exceeds uh, the maximum, then those rebates have to go to generic prices or maybe even to the full list price. Manufacturers are not forced to sign up to rebates. If they don't, then there's no reimbursement for prescribing at the local level. And doctors can use the medicine, but they're going to have to pay for it out of their budgets. So that's what's currently uh, under consideration as uh, those negotiations uh, unfold. Uh, yeah. So, so I think uh, cost effectiveness analysis HTA tells us something clearly about how much we can afford to pay for. Uh, the benefits that a new technology offers. And as we saw earlier, P-STAR represents the maximum we can afford to pay, then the value of an innovation can be thought of as P-STAR times Q-STAR, the 
quantity for the indication or the multiple indications that that product is available for. Now, of course, if we pay PSTAR uh, during the patent, then, of course, the manufacturers appropriate all the value during the patent period. We start to get value when the patent expires and we switch prescribing to generics, or we recalibrate the maximum we can afford to pay according to those generic prices. At global prices, which are much higher than PSTAR, what we can afford to pay, that upper area represents the net harm that will be done to our healthcare system if we pay global prices. Of course, within an indication, we will have different subgroups which will have different costs and benefits. And for many drugs, we have multiple indications for the same drug. In other words, the most we can afford to pay for a drug differs by subgroup and differs by indication. So in actual fact, the rebate, the rebate we wish to pay, or the rebate we need to pay, is if you like the difference between the global price and the outer envelope of this uh, price discriminating uh, value. In a way, this kind of shows us what that might mean for across different healthcare systems, that rather than having different subgroups or different indications, what we have are different healthcare systems, each of which face different health opportunity costs, and so the maximum they can afford to pay under the patent differs markedly. So the notion of facilitating price discrimination both within the healthcare system and between healthcare systems has a number of advantages. What does it mean? It means pay the monopoly price. Now, the monopoly price is not the global price. The monopoly price is the most a healthcare system can afford to pay within the patent. That way we respect patents and intellectual property rights, but it means that we don't damage our healthcare system whilst uh, the patent's in place. We have rebates that are benchmarked to generic entry, and of course it's really important to encourage uh, generic entry, uh, and, and where we can't ensure a competitive generic market, we make sure we regulate. So by, by facilitating price discrimination, between and within healthcare systems, it's possible that both healthcare systems and manufacturers can benefit. It's no longer a zero-sum game. Actually, there's additional value that can be shared through negotiation. It also means that we continue to encourage evidence about heterogeneity. It also means that actually everybody is able to participate in that market. And rather than healthcare systems which are uh, uh, healthcare systems with lower healthcare expenditure, rather than face a choice of either allowing access to new technologies but doing considerable harm, or denying access and suffering the political consequences of not being able to offer access to their populations, that we can overcome that difficulty. So I believe there's potentially global benefits of thinking about ways in which we can facilitate price discrimination. But I think overall, I suppose my main message is that um, our ex experience in the UK is the importance about clarity of what a cost effectiveness threshold ought to represent. Certainly the kind of cost effectiveness thresholds that are out there and people talk about are nothing more than norms that describe how recommendations have been made. That's certainly true for NICE, 20 to 30,000 pounds per quality is no evidential foundation whatsoever. The World Health Organization, one to three times GDP per capita, again, has no real evidential foundation. It's just become a norm that has been used uh, 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 quite widely. The other thing, the other kind of notion of a threshold that people have talked about is essentially a consumption value of health, how much consumption individuals are willing to give up to improve their health. In a sense, if you like, think about that as the demand side of healthcare, sometimes uh, founded on uh, literature around the value of a statistical life, either revealed or expressed preferences, or another literature which has looked at willingness pay to avert a dally or gain a quality, whether that's mainly based on expressed preferences, contingent valuation, discrete choice experiments. I think the problem with those demand side values is it, it doesn't reflect what our healthcare system is currently delivering. What we really want is that kind of supply side estimate of marginal productivity of healthcare expenditure. In other words, the health effects of changes in healthcare expenditure. 
And what we would expect is to see a difference between demand side and supply side values. That's certainly true in the UK. A reasonable estimate of the consumption value of a quality based on the literature is something in the region of 30, maybe 40,000 pounds per quality. But our estimate of the supply side is about 15,000 pounds per quality. What does that tell us, that discrepancy? It tells us something about the relative value of public expenditure on health. It's telling us that an NHS pound in the NHS budget is worth two consumption pounds in somebody's pocket. And that's exactly what we would expect given the difficulties of raising public finance for collectively funded healthcare. We would expect there to be a shadow price on public expenditure. Public expenditure is relatively scarce compared to consumption and therefore is more valuable. That's exactly what we would expect. What about the evidence to support an assessment of health opportunity costs in other healthcare systems? Well, there's a number of estimates now, particularly in higher income countries, using within country data. So we have a number of estimates now for the UK. We have estimates from Australia, Spain, Netherlands, Norway, some estimates as well coming out of South Africa using uh, within country data. Um, certainly the UK estimates might have some implications for other countries. There's a paper by Woods et al, which takes our estimate and then asks the question, what do we know about income elasticities of demand? And how might this translate uh, for other countries? And we can also use published estimates of the mortality effect of healthcare expenditure from country level data and apply that to what we know about the epidemiology and the demographics and healthcare expenditure in particular countries. And that's, I think, what's going to be presented this afternoon. So, yeah, so this is from Woods. If we take the UK estimate, so in the UK, our estimates suggest that we can afford to pay about half a GDP per capita to, 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 to gain a quality adjusted life year. That's true in the UK, what might it mean for other healthcare systems? Well, we can think about that by applying estimated income elasticities of demand and making some assumptions about the relative underfunding of healthcare systems. That suggests that for other healthcare systems, it's likely to be substantially less than one times GDP per capita. If the UK can only afford half a GDP per capita, it seems very unlikely that other low and middle income countries can afford substantially more than one times GDP per capita. If we apply estimates of the mortality effect that we get from cross-country data to uh, 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 the epidemiology and demographics in, uh, uh, and health expenditures in those other countries, I think Jessica's going to show that this in a bit more detail, we can get estimates, uh, in this case of cost per daily averted, and what you can see for these middle income countries is most of those estimates lie below one times GDP per capita. And some of them are substantially below. This is the same, the same estimates, but now including low income countries and just looking at it by uh, under five mortality rate. And what you can see is that we've got a real range of potential cost effectiveness thresholds or health opportunity costs, but very many of those health opportunity costs are very low indeed. Telling us a couple of things, telling us that healthcare expenditure in these countries is very productive at the margin, that we get an awful lot of health for a marginal increase in healthcare expenditure, but it's also telling us something about how much we can afford to pay for new technologies, that the most we can afford to pay uh, is very much lower uh, and possibly as low as the generic prices in any event. Let me just finish up by trying to show how these ideas of health opportunity costs can be used to uh, make sure HTA can inform broader questions about investment in infrastructure and investments in reducing constraints in the healthcare system as a whole and strengthening the system. Let me just try and quickly illustrate it and then I'll finish because I've talked for quite a long time. The truth is that a simple categorical assessment of cost effectiveness, is it cost effective, yes or no, isn't really that helpful. It's not enough. It's not enough. If we're thinking about where we should place our greatest effort into making sure that certain programs get implemented in our healthcare system, what we need to understand is the scale of the potential net health impact and the amount of resource that might be devoted to those implementation efforts, whatever might be required, whether that's investment in infrastructure, whether that's other constraints, or wider questions of system strengthening. Let me kind of 
try and uh, illustrate it for you. We've got four interventions uh, in this particular uh, setting where the health opportunity costs are quite high. Health opportunity costs can be represented $200 uh, a Virtue 1 DALI. We've got different populations relevant to these different interventions. And intervention one has got an ISA of uh, $300 per DALI, two, 200, 100, and intervention four is cost saving. Now, if we just used this kind of categorical assessment, is it cost effective or not? then we'd say that intervention two, three, and four is cost effective and should be prioritized. But it doesn't tell us much about which one's most important and how much we should spend to make sure it happens. But as soon as we've got a, an estimate of health opportunity cost, we can do that. We can express the net dallies averted for each of these interventions, and we can express the net monetary benefit or the uh, value to the healthcare system of making sure each of these interventions is implemented. So intervention two, which we might call cost effective, actually the net health benefit is zero. The benefits are just offset by the health opportunity costs elsewhere. There's absolutely no value in spending additional resource making sure that actually gets implemented within the health benefits package. It's intervention four where the most value lies because not only do we have direct benefits, we're also saving the highest net health benefits and uh, ought to be prioritized because we should be willing to pay up to 80 million pounds to make sure that intervention one gets fully implemented within our healthcare system. So just a brief uh, stylized illustration of once we have an estimate of health opportunity cost, we can use the results of HTA in a much more uh, broader and more useful way. We can express the scale of potential net health benefit. And we can also express that in terms of the resources of the healthcare system and how much we should be willing to pay to ensure those things actually get implemented in a way that can start to inform investments in infrastructure, investments in relieving constraints, and investments in broader um, system strengthening. So just to really sum up, uh, I guess the theme is an assessment of health opportunity cost is critical. If we have a threshold that is too high, then we're going to make decisions that reduce health outcomes overall. And we're going to underestimate the real value of increased healthcare expenditure. I think sometimes in the field, people have talked about decision rules. I don't believe in decision rules. I don't think there is a rule. Uh, I regard the job of economists is not to prescribe social choice or believe we know what the social welfare function looks like. I believe our role is to contribute to accountable social choices made on others' behalf. In a sense, having an idea of, so, uh, of uh, health opportunity cost is part of that, that we can represent what the costs and what the health opportunity costs of these options are and allow those things to be traded off with other attributes of benefit which might be more difficult to specify and quantify. I think we've got a natural way to start to think about better purchasing decisions. Health opportunity cost tells us the health value of healthcare costs, so we can start to value Im improved purchasing in terms of the health outcome that that can generate. It tells us something about the most that can be offered for incentives for performance by results scheme. We've, been we've used this type of analysis in the UK to inform priorities around how we incentivize our primary care doctors to do certain things. And as I've said before, I think it tells us something about the most we can afford to pay for branded drugs. But I guess
for me, um, the most important thing for me uh, about this work is not um, is not the methods, it's, it, it, it's not the sophistication of the econometrics, and it's not the particular number. Uh, for me, the most the most important thing about this work, and, and I think the impact that it's had in the UK, is that it is a way to communicate the principles and ethics of decisions, and that an ethical and principled decision has to consider healthcare costs, because healthcare costs are other people's health. Now, economists always make that argument about opportunity costs. But actually, to the broader public, it sounds very abstract and not very real. And even to clinical communities, it doesn't sound very real. It just sounds like an artifact of, a, of economists talking about what they like to talk about. But when you have the evidence, when you have the evidence, when you can show that these are real health effects and that we know not only something about their scale, but something about where they are likely to occur and who is likely to bear them, it really changes the nature of the debate. And... Um, in a sense, it makes those that have, who bear the true opportunity cost of our choices, who are often hidden and unknown, it makes them a little bit more real so they can be taken proper account of when social choices are made. So thank you for listening. I've spoken for a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Claxton. May I now invite Dr. Murlidran to discuss the first paper. Is the folder? Ah, here. Yeah. This one. It'll be there. It'll be there. Okay. No, no, I've loaded it. So, so uh, morning and thank you very much. Uh, um, we had a very exhaustive. Uh, uh, presentation of the various dimensions involved in uh, carrying out HTA and how it would be useful uh, in prioritizing healthcare intervention. Um, what I will do is, in fact, I read the slides, and then towards the end, I made my notes. So uh, I will pass it on <laughs> to this is a quick run through of this. Okay. I have three sets of observations or comments. Um, so as I said, it was very lucid presentation uh, and illustrations of the conceptual basis of HTA, nature of data or information required to undertake such HTA studies, and how useful such exercises would be in prioritizing public spending. <clears throat> Slide two actually is very the key. <laughs> I have underlined the word worthwhile. Uh, that takes us directly to the notion of uh, threshold. Uh, as Pullier and many others have said, that without the notion of threshold, concept of threshold, uh, merely having cost effectiveness issues would not be of uh, help. So the point I really want to ask is that this, what has been the experience in the UK of the NICE in uh, arriving at the thresholds? Um, thresholds are not something, again, you get by uh, having a formula, as I understand that it is to have a series of consultations, if you call it negotiations. <laughs> and uh, what has been the experience? In fact, I would like to hear, uh, because the whole exercise revolves around that. And um, if you permit me, I will use uh, Kulia's uh, bookshelf model just to illustrate again, uh, maybe it will further supplement those of us here in understanding threshold. So this one gives you on the y-axis uh, health benefit per, per dollar or thousand, and then the, uh, each one is a 
like a bookshelf you can say size of the uh, book you can see varies and the thickness of the book tells you the discounted value of the total expenditure made and the area of each spine overall gives you the total health benefits but if you have a threshold at t0 then you will see uh, with the budget limit that you have uh, where you stop because anyway budget will make you stop somewhere <laughs> and those on the right hand side outside the plan uh, though you may want to support but the budget will not support if you don't have a threshold if you don't have a threshold you may end up with having um, the one two three four the fifth uh, intervention uh, which has a much lower total health gain than the one which is on the right hand side which is taller than that so actually there's a net loss by having that intervention because you didn't have a threshold so it's important that we have and therefore we'll at least know how much we are losing by having some programs out or in and, and of course empirically it is something that we can talk about to what extent uh, in the indian context we can have this bookshelf <laughs> so um I really therefore want to ask uh, Carl that your experience in arriving at threshold. Uh, so that's my first uh, substantial question. In fact, I would like to uh, hear from you uh, historically how you have gone about. Uh, much of your uh, early experience in NICE is on developing guidelines, for example, and apart from doing appraisals. So uh, in the Indian context, we can think of, you know, what is to what extent guidelines are there and before you arrive at the thresholds and so on okay. the second is a little uh, um, uh, detailed uh, one of the slides in which you showed about the uh, cost effectiveness cost per daily averted for india you know the range is up to 5000 or something just want to know is this the result of net result of all interventions presumably so that means you are able to get uh, uh, such a value for various interventions and you've got somehow aggregated. Uh, also, I would like to know, I know you have quoted it from probably your own work or uh, maybe the Lancet papers, uh, the, the data on uh, the sources of the Indian data used for CPD, that is cost per daily averted. Could you throw some light on that? So I used this analogy, this, uh, you know, Chandigarh airport was closed, <laughs> you know, halt uh, before we, we have to prepare uh, in order to let larger aircraft arrive. <laughs> so I feel uh, that HTA as we do, uh, like the UK context, you know, how functional are our health facilities, particularly as you go down, as you go up, the district hospitals are overflowing. As you go down, you have either dysfunctional or unperforming. Um, you know, you need to have some, otherwise you may end up having a very low estimated per unit cost of a service delivery or otherwise as well. So I, I, I think before we undertake, perhaps uh, uh, can you comment on uh, the level of service level efficiency required or that you uh, expect from the US, from the NICE perspective, before you um, estimate costs uh, on the public side. Uh, as you know, uh, we are struggling with both numerator and the denominators. <laughs> um, you know, the number of estimates that you've shown, you know, age wise, sex wise, uh, programmatic effort wise, uh, particularly in estimating marginal productivity of health spending on health. Uh, both uh, our estimates on, uh, uh, for example, our MMR estimates or IMR estimates and so many under five mortalities, how uh, robust are they? How robust our estimates are on government spending? In fact, hardly we have just begun to do estimates of state health accounts and how much government is spending. Even the estimates of that is uh, just beginning to appear. So. All that we are saying is that uh, 
we we have made a wonderful uh, step forward uh, six months ago icmr and dhr have established the board and that i think is a very good uh, step but in the process what we what i feel is that with the given budget um before we do uh, in the next slide i will suggest what we can do uh, there is plenty of uh, space for uh, reducing our wasteful spending um, one suggestion as part of uhc is that bf beef up the primary health care system and then you will find enormous amount of money being spent uh, saved within public system by diverting patients who are going uh, to district hospitals uh, to primary health care centers <clears> the <throat> show level um, as i said i repeat uh, which i think you made it several times uh, is a key concept uh, cannot be said independently of budgetary limits as well that also you mentioned uh, the show levels as you also mentioned that can be approached from both supply side and demand side i think but supply side is the first step that we should uh, move towards uh, otherwise setting uh, the show too high or too low uh, could cost lives, as we saw in that uh, bookshelf model. So I'll conclude with uh, just one or two suggestions that we uh, um, may be useful to undertake a series of you know, costing exercise. I think the PGI Chandigarh is involved in uh, undertaking a costing study across 10 different states, including Tamil Nadu. In fact, we've had many discussions on their sampling uh, actually ended up picking up facilities which are uh, hugely underperforming. <laughs> you know, so what should be the level of performance of these facilities that should be used as samples in your estimates is very important. Um, so in the in the pro, in the process, build our statistical capacity in a number of ways. I think uh, um, with that general comment, I will close. Uh, my remarks on this. I'm not going into the methodologies, as you said, because uh, um, from whatever you have said with the numbers that you have and the conceptual uh, soundness, that's that is something that I, I, I have nothing more to add to uh, what you have said. Uh, I'm just looking at it uh, from the Indian point of view. Um, while, uh, while we should prepare ourselves statistically and otherwise methodologically, carrying out STA to prioritize, uh, we should be uh, preparing ourselves in several other ways, both build our capacity to undertake such studies as well as uh, demonstrate the utility of such exercises to the policy makers. I think that first step is being made, but we have a long way to go. Uh, I'll conclude with that. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe together. We'll uh, together have the second might, discussion. Uh, yeah. Can I invite Dr. Tanjila to please <clears throat> Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for an excellent presentation. And I will try to focus on three aspects. One is but actually address three questions that how relevant these things in the context of you know, low and middle income countries, especially India. And second is, uh, what are the methodological issues that need to be, you know, further you know, looked into, etc. And third is the practicality, the practical issues, in the context of Indian health market. What's the relevance? Uh, I see it is highly relevant. You know, it's it's basically based on a very simple economic principle that you know it's not a new thing that uh, what we are seeing here. It's basically the, those economic students who are trained in neoclassical paradigm, they know that the maximization of quality subject to a given resource constant. That's what is happening here. And at the same time, the opportunity costs <coughs> are being estimated. Uh, the advantage is that, the problem is that for Indian researchers you know, uh, who, who try to do economic evaluation, we do evaluation we say that it's cost effective. How? Now we have WHO threshold, so on the basis of that, we do that. Or alternatively, we compare with the international benchmarks and then say that it's cost effective or not. Carl rightly said that just saying a call, whether it is cost effective or not is not enough. We have to see 
that what opportunity cost they involve. And in that sense, if something is very cost effective, may have actually another program, another parallel intervention, which may not have that much opportunity cost. Uh, problem is that this opportunity cost is silent. Like the dog in Sherlock Holmes story, Silver Blaze, you know, where the crime happened, the dog was silent. And Holmes asked the police inspector that, do you want me to look at something? The inspector says that, no, nothing. Holmes asked, what about the dog? Then the inspector says that nothing. He didn't, the dog didn't bark. And Holmes said, that's the most curious thing. Why it didn't bark? So in opportunity cost, it's a silent dog. It doesn't bark. And as a result, we take a wrong decision or we may take a risk in that. So in that sense, it is highly relevant. And I see it will be a great contribution uh, if uh, the estimates come on the threshold. Now, coming to the methodological part, uh, methodologically, it's basically based on incremental cost effective ratio, which is again based on the maximization of quality principle. As an economist or a student of economics, it's very difficult to disagree with that. We cannot do that. Uh, Gavin Mooney once said that in a paper, that as an economist, I cannot disagree with quality. But at the same time, I cannot agree with it either when I you know, take off the cap of economics. So, uh, but from the economics point of view, it's obviously this kind of question. But my fundamental problem is in two aspects. One is, of course, equity aspects. Another is the efficiency aspects. In the equity aspects, it is argued that, many people argue that, that when you talk about maximization of quality, are you really talking about, you know, are you considering the equity angle uh, in that sense, in, in that case? For example, you know, uh, there are examples like, you know, like the for example, permanently disabled people, you know, uh, this is called famous double jeopardy problem. That is, according to Kuali, the permanently disabled problem has very little value. And whereas, 